Hi, and welcome to another episode of SwitchCast, a podcast delving into the world of film brought to you by the team at Switch. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Charlie David Page. I'm Jess Fenton. I'm Daniel Lemon. And I'm Jake Watt. It's Thursday the 26th of October 2017. And on this week's show, turn off the lights and get ready to hide under the blankets. We're revealing our scariest films to watch this Halloween. And as always, all our reviews and giveaways. Let's get straight into it with Thor Ragnarok, the latest of the Avenger films. Daniel grabbed his hammer and headed to the cinema to catch this much-anticipated instalment, so did it hit the nail on the head? Well, after two not-so-memorable films, it looks like the God of Thunder has finally found his groove. Thor, played by Chris Hemsworth, is having one hell of a family reunion. For one thing, his mischievous brother Loki, played by Tom Hiddleston, isn't dead after all, and has been pretending to be their father Odin, played by Anthony Hopkins. More shocking, though, is the arrival of Hela, played by Kate Blanchett, an older sister he never knew he had, and the goddess of death, hell-bent on destroying Asgard. Blasted out of the realm, Thor finds himself a gladiator for the flamboyant Grand Master, played by Jeff Goldblum, on the isolated trash planet of Sakaar. His only chances of returning to Asgard are his duplicitous brother, the only remaining and constantly drunk Valkyrie, played by Tessa Thompson, and an unexpected old friend and fellow gladiator, the Incredible Hulk, played by Mark Ruffalo. Hello, the goddess of death has invaded Asgard. Oh, I've missed this. And you and I had a fight recently. Did I win? No, I won easily. Doesn't sound right. Well, that's true. Asgard is dead. And it will be reborn in my image. I thought you'd be glad to see me. I need to stop her here and now to prevent Ragnarok, the end of everything. So I'm putting together a team. Like the old days. The screenplay leaves a bit to be desired, but in the hands of New Zealand auteur Taika Waititi, Thor Ragnarok is the shot of adrenaline this franchise needed. Beautifully directed, visually rich, and screamingly funny, this fantasy sci-fi buddy comedy jettisons Shakespearean pomposity for an irreverence, cheekiness, and wouldn't give a rat's ass what anyone thinks attitude embraced by everyone involved. Hemsworth is a delight, and even more of a babe than usual. Thompson is badass as hell, and Blanchett is eating every piece of scenery thrown at her with relish, while Jeff Goldblum enjoys a film basically built as a monument to his own awesomeness. But the real star is Taika Waititi, who brings his distinct Kiwi tone and his batshit imagination to its biggest canvas yet. And he handles the blockbuster form with shocking confidence. Marvel needs to be commended for bringing an auteur into their franchise, and actually letting them bring all the things that made them an auteur in the first place. There are some clunky moments in performances, and Marvel still don't seem to know how to handle their villains. But overall, Thor Ragnarok is a tremendously entertaining, 80 s fueled psychedelic, ridiculous, preposterous, and irreverent thrill ride, and doesn't give a hoot what anyone thinks of it. This is easily one of the best blockbusters of the year. I'm giving it three and a half stars. Well, Daniel, you sure went hammer and tongs on that review. I'll let Chris Hemsworth hit whatever he wants on my head. <laughs> Oh, just before you were praising Takai Watiti and all his hotness, and now you've 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 defected. Everybody in this film is hot. Let's be honest; it's the <laughs> hottest. Marvel have not ex- assembled a hotter cast, and not just in terms of like their looks, but just the 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 talent. It's ridiculous. It's offensive. I'm offended mm. by how talented this cast is and crew. But what's worse is that what do people find most attractive in an attractive partner of, you know, their desired sex is sense of humor. And this is the funniest movie in the Marvel franchise, hands down. It looks like everyone's having so much fun. And it's about bloody time because, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I, you know, I've always been quite open about how critical I am of the um, of the Marvel universe. And it, I have to admit, I've, I've enjoyed the last few years where it started to finally find its footing. But the thing that's always annoyed me about them is the fact that the directors they choose don't necessarily have any sense of style or vision. You take that back, Joss Whedon is a god. Joss Whedon <laughs> is a pustule on the face of cinema and television. I cannot wait. God. I cannot wait for everyone else to realise that. 
No. Drove the Avengers into the ground. Both Avengers films are fucking bullshit films. I hate them. I cannot stand either of them. And I, to be honest, when he left the franchise, that was the point where I think the franchise started to find its feet. Because it was... The, the thing that's been nice about the last few films is they've been trying to find the individuality, but getting a director of the caliber of Taika Waititi on this film, the fact they've gone for someone who has no credentials in a blockbuster arena, yeah. but has such a clear and distinct and acclaimed style all to his own, and the fact that they're just kind of letting him do his thing with a cast of a ridiculous caliber who you can almost guarantee are not there because it's a Marvel film. You don't get Kate Blanchett in because it's a Marvel film. She's doing it because she wants to work with an acclaimed, idiosyncratic, brilliant director whose previous films have all won tremendous acclaim and been amongst the best films of their respective years. And I think she wants to have fun for once. Like everyone oh who's, God, yeah. all the behind the scenes stuff, they all talk about that this was has to be one of the most <laughs> fun sets they have ever worked on ever and these are people whose you know list of films are by no means small or short and um yeah they just talk about how this was their favorite this was the most fun and Takawatiti, given the scope of this franchise was given such autonomy over its feel its tone its script and he's just gone you know what we're throwing the script out the window go you know improvise the shit out of everything and we're just going to have a great time with it and it seems to have worked and like the buzz that this film is getting is huge huge and it's funny to see it as a comparison to the way marvel's handled bringing on a idiosyncratic director as a comparison to the way that Lucasfilm has handled it. It was a similar thing with James Gunn on Guardians of the Galaxy and the freshness and beauty of Guardians of the Galaxy was that it was of its own thing and it was distinct. They seem to be able to, as the years have gone on, now that they've found, they've really probably found their feet in constructing this extended universe gone we're taking these directors because of what makes them special and unique we're setting the parameters that we'd like those directors to work in but we're actually letting them work within their own style unlike what lucasfilm Mm. seems to be doing hopefully not with rian johnson but with everybody else of just kind of crushing any sense of what makes them special and unique I had no interest in seeing this film until Taika Waititi was put on as director. And then all of a sudden it went to one of the most exciting films of the year. It's pretty incredible when you consider like how like bad the previous Thor films were. Like um, the Kenneth Branagh yeah. first one wasn't wasn't so bad, but, Ken- but Kenneth Branagh like was just like, you know, I don't want to come back for the next one. Mm. And then um, they actually had like, you know, trouble finding a director for the second like Thor film because... Um, Marvel had their reputation for overmanaging their creatives. They, at one point, they had a female director attached to it, didn't they? Oh, I think it was a rumor. I thought I didn't think it was actually like confirmed. But. Yeah, no, no, I remember that rumor as well. Um, and then Alan Taylor came on, who was just you know pretty like his experience in the past was working on Game of Thrones, um, yeah. like, you know, TV stuff. And he came on, and then he he finished uh, Thor two. Thor two is the like uh, most critically savaged Marvel movie, I think. It has like the lowest rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. And um, he said he'd never work for Marvel again. Most Marvel fans place it at the bottom. I've never seen it. I didn't bother because yeah. I heard it wasn't very good. And at that point, I was pretty anti the Marvel franchise in general. It's pretty crap. But so it's actually pretty amazing that they brought in a, yeah. someone to work on the, the third part of Thor and um, they would just let him run wild with it. They're just going, okay, well, overmanaging has just not worked with this particular you know, series. So let's just like, you know, get this guy in here, let him do whatever he wants to do. He couldn't do a worse job. No. Yeah, exactly. He couldn't do a worse job, but like the (laughs) the sort of, I guess his um, take on it is like, you know, a a high comedy kind of sci-fi, you know, Flash Gordon inspired Thor is like so different from like, you know, the Kenneth Branagh one and the Alan Taylor one. Mm. So it's um, kind of nice that they let him, let you know, one guy have his freedom and it seems to be paying off. And pulling in a cast of people like Kate Blanchett and uh, Jeff Goldblum and Tessa Thompson. Like you list, you look at the list of people involved mm. in this film, you just go, oh, I want to see them fuck around in this man's universe. Like just kind of do their thing. But also really exciting, you got Rachel House into the film who played the, um, the child protection officer in... Uh, uh, Hunt for the Wilder People, who is a fucking standout yes. in that film, and able to bring in his own yeah. collaborators as well. It's because uh, I mean, as great as a director as he is, obviously on a film, an artist is as great as their collaborators. And so the fact that it looks like they've allowed him to bring a lot of his own collaborative team is really exciting. So it feels like the right move for Marvel to make oh, totally. in order to distinguish themselves as a growing franchise. This, uh, it's like, you know, coming towards the end of uh, end of phase one for Marvel as well. So it's like this movie and then um, the next Avengers movie where they all fight yeah. Thanos. And then um, according to Kevin Feige, like that's kind of, you know, the cutoff point for... Feige. 
Feige, um, according to Feige, um, it's the the cutoff point for Phase One. So, and it's going to usher in the next sort of you know generation of um, Phase Three. By the way, yeah, we're already oh, up phase, to Phase Three. It? Whatever the fuck that means, we're up to Phase Three. Oh, phase Three. Anyway, but yeah, I think it's really cool that we can have a film that doesn't take itself too seriously, that you can have a universe with these different kind of textures. Uh, not everything has to be the same. Like you said, with the Lucasfilm stuff, I like, you know, the Star Wars franchise is just, mm. to me, stale. And uh, it's it's nice that they can have a bit of fun. Like, it's remember, it's like not just going mm. and watching three hours of action, which is what most of the Marvel films are these days. It's, you know. Well, it's like Jess bringing up Batman, the original Batman last week of, you know, the, 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 their films that were actually also based partly on their entertainment value. And their entertainment was about humor and color and yeah. energy. Because of what Christopher Nolan did with the Dark Knight trilogy, which in, in itself is remarkable as a, yeah. a kind of anomaly, but it just became too much of a, a standard. It's nice to see this might actually be entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Something which is like just full of color and fun and energy. And yeah, I think we've we've missed that. We've really missed that. Well, you can find my full review at maketheswitch.com.au and Thor Ragnarok is in cinemas now. Also out today is Suburbicon. Jess took in this star-studded crime comedy, but did you make it out alive? Welcome to Suburbicon, where the grass is greener, the air is cleaner, and the people are whiter. That's right, we're smack bang in the middle of 1950s racist America. There's a lot going on in Suburbicon. The town's first black family have moved in, sending everyone into a tizzy. Meanwhile, next door, the home of Gardner Lodge, his wife Rose, sister-in-law Margaret, and son Nicky are in the middle of a home invasion. Everyone is rattled by this incident, particularly Nikki, and life afterwards is a bit of adjustment, but not all is as it seems in quiet suburbicon. These animals took everything from us. I have to make decisions like what's best for the family. <laughs> Any progress on the investigation? A mobster got killed a couple of days ago. I can end the conversation real quick. I'm sorry for his loss of life. Yeah, I guess he probably is too. Nobody speak. I'm here to collect. What do you want? I want all of it. All of it. Nothing like this ever happened here. This is a safe place. It was. The good guys aren't always good and the bad guys aren't always bad. And it's not about who's going to come out on top, but who's going to come out alive. Suburbicon is dark, witty, and with a cast to die for, but with a script penned by the Coen brothers and George Clooney and his filmmaking partner Grant Heslov, it's a case of too many cooks. It's not quite a Coen brothers movie, nor is it a Clooney Heslov. It's not dark enough, satirical enough, or smart enough to fully belong to either team, so in the end, it's a tonal mess that's practically two films smacked together, and neither one is great. George Clooney's movie-making prowess hasn't been great his last couple go-arounds, and partnering up with his Oh Brother Where Art Thou and Hail Caesar Pals seemed like a match made in heaven, but alas, no. Better luck next time, Georgie boy. I'm still rooting for you. Two and a half stars. I'm really intrigued to know more about the history behind this film. We talked about this when we did the trailer app on this one very early on in the podcast about how derivative it felt of a Coen Brothers film. And it's written by the Coen Brothers, but it was also written by Clooney and his co-writer um, Grant Heslov, who they've worked... I think Grant Heslov has worked on all of George Clooney's films. Yeah. Um, so I'd be really intrigued to know what involvement they have had on this, the Coen Brothers, to what degree this belongs within their cinematic universe. It doesn't surprise me this hasn't had a great response because it just looks a little too derivative. Of themselves? Well, no, when other... I always find when other directors direct the Coen brothers' work, with the exception of maybe Bridge of Spies because they only kind of did a polish of that screenplay. But only the Coen brothers can kind of get the Coen brothers right. They understand the internal logic of the worlds they create and the characters they create and the rhythm of their language. And not even they can get it right all the time. There are duds in there. Um... And I just remember thinking, watching this trailer, thinking, I've seen this film before. And I think, even just from the trailer, I went, I don't feel like this is a particularly good handling of this kind of film. I don't know what it gives me that makes me want to see it. 
Well, the thing is, Clooney and the Coen brothers have worked together before. Mm. So obviously, you know, they know him, they know his style, and they must have collaborated well together on Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? So they've entrusted him with this script, and now it's sort of gone down the crapper. But that could just be George Clooney. I mean, his last movie, Monuments Men, was... Yeah, Terrible. he hasn't had the best. Terrible. He hasn't had the best. He's rate. not getting better yeah. with time. He's getting worse. Not I don't lately, understand how no. that happens. Yeah, yeah. He started out really strong. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind was his first, which I love. He followed that with um, Good Night, Good Luck, which I even remember having reservations about that back then. That I thought it was very handsomely made, but I wasn't overly in love with it. I found it a little spotty, and not quite as focused as it could have been. I had issues with the script more than the direction. I thought that, yeah, I thought the direction was fine, but I thought the script was a bit yeah. unenthusiastic. But, and then, yeah, he's kind of gone a bit downhill from there. We yeah. had Leatherheads, Ides of March, Monuments Men, and now Suburbicon. And yeah, so it's it's this weird thing where, as Jess says, he seems to be getting worse rather than getting better. And his films have always been a little derivative of the, of the Coen brothers. Like I, the ones that I've seen, I've always kind of thought to myself, you've picked up a lot of the traits from them in his work. So it doesn't overly surprise me that he would end up directing a Coen yeah. brothers script, but it also doesn't surprise me that from what we're hearing about the film, that it doesn't quite seem to gel together. I'm, I'm sincerely disappointed that this is kind of getting the rap that it has. I was really keen for it. Like, I think it's an amazing cast. It looks quite interesting, but it just doesn't seem to have been executed very well. That's the disappointing thing. And I think this has got to be one of the worst years that we've had for this, this time of year. It's kind of this dead zone between the film festivals and the pre-Christmas uh, films. A lot of the films they were expecting to hit haven't hit at all yeah we've had we've had like a bunch of stinkers the last like i don't know month or two so this is just adding to those well you know we've still got call me by your name on the horizon that'll make everything better when it turns up (laughs) well hopefully we um when we come up to the boxing day films there will be a bunch of really interesting things in there so Mm. this however clearly not Indeed, but for now we're stuck with Suburbicon, which is in cinemas now, and you can check out my full review at makethe-switch.com.au. The Midwife is also in cinemas today. Claire, played by Catherine Frott, is a dedicated midwife and single mother. When her maternity ward is closed, she's forced to take a job at a larger corporate clinic and struggles to adapt to the financially driven work environment. Meanwhile, the mistress of her deceased father, Beatrice, played by Catherine Deneuve, makes contact with Claire 30 years after she vanished. This free spirit wants to meet again, and although Claire is initially hesitant, the pair form an uneasy friendship after Beatrice reveals that she has brain cancer. Um, Daniel, what would you say your favourite French movie is? (laughs) (laughs) You bastard. You bastard. Throw him under the bus already. um, Any French films that I love, and I are quite a few from... Just one, Daniel. Um, One is fine. I don't know. Um, Oh... No, I, look, I'm, I'm sure I do have some. <laughs> if any of them, they're all pre-Amelie, because basically post-Amelie, I just can't, I'm not on board with French film. I And just oh, even oh, reading oh. the... Say The Fifth Element. That's technically... That's yeah, technically, French, that's technically pre-Amelie, so... But, like, you know, French cinema is, is, you know, they have films like Le Diabolique and The Children of Paradise, and, you know, the, the, the legacy of French film is so strong, and I just find French film now so fucking dull... Like, even just mm. the description of this film... And this is terrible, because I haven't seen this film, obviously, but even the description of this film made me want to go to sleep. It's so serious and so uh, po-faced and overwrought. overwrought and- yeah. When I read, like, synopsis like this, I always think of, like, the um, the diving bell and the butterfly. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, that is a beautiful this- film. But I think that's directed by an American, or it's a French-Canadian film. Yeah. Most French, mm. French-language French films I've loved of the last few years have all been French-Canadians. Films like Monsieur Lazar or any of Xavier Dolan's films. Most of the time, the films coming out of French Canada is much, are much more interesting to me than anything coming out of France. What do you think that is? I don't know. I'm going to get in so much trouble for this. Every time I mention to a film buff that I don't like French film, they always get very angry at me. It's There's a sense of nihilistic seriousness and flippancy to the way that I see French films. And then in, on the, in terms of their dramas, in terms of the comedies, I find them mostly incredibly racist and going for the lowest, cheapest blows to people that don't deserve to have mm. those kind of cheap blows thrown at them. I remember there was a film about, oh, I can't remember what it was called, but about chefs years ago that was so cripplingly racist that I, it was infuriating how racist it was. Oh, Daniel, was it Le Chef? Le Chef, yeah. Oh, fucking awful. Yeah. Um, but like even saying, I don't like 
And I mean, as much as they're kind of, I think they're, they might be Austrian, but the Darden brothers who do their, all their films in French, they did um, Two Days and One Night or something a few years ago and The Kid with the Bike. And it's that sense of we're going to capture a slice of life in our films, but everything is going to be very depressing and it's going to be an allegory. But we're not going to tell you what the allegory is, but you just get to work it out for yourself. Or it's a lot of very, you know, films like um, Olivia Assayas' After May which was just a bunch of white privileged kids in the 70s sitting around drinking wine in fields full of flowers talking about how terrible it was the situations happening in as you know small european countries collapsed in the distance and how we should go protest them oh sure do you want to make out sure and it was just this 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 kind of um yeah i don't know i'm probably getting myself in so much trouble and you've taken this blow against me jake because you know that i'm tired and i'm coming down with a cold Mm. so (laughs) screw you (laughs) but i for one am not that interested what about french comedies have you seen any french comedies i i haven't seen many french comedies and to be honest i'm not a big fan of them a lot of the early ones like the jacques tati films gorgeous Mm. but yeah i'm not a big fan of french again i find french comedies often really kind of on the nose and cheap and racist and i don't appreciate that about them <laughs> they're not so much racist as french people are elitists yes that's i think that's also it. it's a sense of elitism that comes with their films that they are very important they're very they're about things how dare you get me on this rant i'm gonna get into so much trouble i'm Jake gonna lose friends over this jake poked the bear i'm just gonna throw jake in before it uh, wraps up uh, lahane really good french movie anyone that's like the uh, probably my my all time favorite French film. Oh yeah, I keep being told I should see that, but that's 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 pre Amelie, so that's fine. No, The Untouchables. Yeah, it's cute. It's it's nice. <laughs> it's a it's a sweet film. So is a Tim Tam. Yes, and I have about as much interest in both. Anyway. All right, now on to a film that is firmly American, so Daniel might actually enjoy this one. Thank also God. out today is Brigsby Bear. Jess got her paws into this one, so was it bearable? It's more than bearable, Charlie. This movie made me positively giddy. Oh. How fun of puns. <laughs> anyway, due to circumstances, James Pope, played by SNL's Kyle Mooney, finds himself an adult entering the real world for the very first time. Naturally, adjustments and learning curves must be made, but his biggest issue is the loss of his favourite TV show, Brigsby Bear Adventures. The reason you're here, the reason I'm here, is all just to help you. Everyone says they're trying to help me, but nobody can find me in the new episode of Brigsby. There wasn't a new episode this week. This is about moving on with the rest of your life. Try to imagine a hero. You, Rigsby Bear, our keeper of the light. Have you ever been with a girl? You really want to do this with me? Yeah, man, I mean, there's not a lot of stuff like this out there. (laughs) You're my friend. Look, I can't say much about the plot without spoiling it, and the less you know, the better anyway. But I will tell you this, Brigsby Bear is fabulous. Originality is back, my friends, and it comes in the form of that curly-haired guy from Saturday Night Live. Who knew? Kyle Mooney wrote, produced, and stars in this magical film called Brigsby Bear. And if this is what's been hiding behind those quirky SNL skits this whole time, then he is wasted in Studio 8H, and he needs to become a bona fide filmmaker today. A brilliant and unexpected cast of familiar faces, newcomers, and bonus cameos, this spectacularly beautiful, heartwarming, and deliriously happy movie will win you over in minutes forever. I'm giving it four and a half stars. So Jess, you actually saw this at uh, Sydney Film Festival, didn't you? I did. Yeah, and I was really keen to see it then. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to, but it just seems like this super cute, uh, quirky little indie comedy, which is kind of like, essentially up my alley it just looks like this really fun film it looks super creative it's got a great cast as well i mean you get like mark hamill's in it like that's kind of cool um, yeah and greg kinnear claire, claire danes, danes yeah. even has a, a small role in it andy sandberg's in it yeah uh andy sandberg produced this mm. film um he did yeah uh and claire danes has a quite a small role in it and so does mark hamill which i think is fabulous i think it highlights just how strong 
the screenplay and the the material was to entice these really great and high caliber actors to take on these really small roles by some sort of nobody from Saturday Night Live. I mean, he, like Carl Mooney is a featured player in the TV show, but he doesn't really get a lot of airtime. Um, he's not really a, a household name yet. And it's just fantastic. This film, it constantly takes turns and takes you in places that you never expect not only the film but any film of this nature to take and it's just it's so refreshing and it is so it's really beautiful it's like it's actually beautiful film all the the themes in it and the relationships and all the characters are really really beautiful sold people and I I love this movie so much and I'm not sure if it's one of those films, you know, you know when you go hungry and you eat something and all of a sudden it could be a piece of shit but it's the best piece of shit you've ever had in your entire life. I'm not sure if I've had this onslaught of such like, shit, such terrible films this year. It's been such a lackluster film that when I finally saw Brigsby Bear, it was such a ray of sunshine. I absolutely naturally fell in love with it wholeheartedly and um, I'm hoping that it actually holds up. I mean, when it was on at the Melbourne Film Festival, it was, it got such a lovely buzz i could i was the same i wanted to try and get to see it but i just couldn't but everyone i've i've heard from or spoken to who's seen it just raves about it um i basically all i know about it is now what you said because it just as soon as i heard that it was a really quirky different um exciting original film i just went into media locked and went okay i don't need to know anymore i'll, I'll just wait and see it so i'm glad it's getting an australian release at all because it sounds like the kind of film that might not it might, you know, have sneaked away without. Well, it's taken a while to get here. It's taken a while to get It's actually had several sort of release dates um, since the film festival screenings in Australia. And it's like, it's, it's finally, it's finally hitting cinemas um, for the mat for the masses to see. And I'm so excited. I'm sick of telling people to watch this movie for months and months and months and months and months um, without knowing when it was coming out or people, you know, forgetting the title or not understand, not be, also not being able to tell people really what mm. it's about because it's such a spoiler. Um, it was hard to get people on board, but now I can actually say to people, hey, on Thursday, go see this movie. You won't regret it. Well, you are going to have to hunt it down. It is unfortunately in limited release in Australia. So there are a few cinemas around that are playing it, but it will take some, uh, some investigation to do. 100% worth it, by the way. Brigsby Bear is in cinemas now. Check it out and my full review at maketheswitch.com.au. The Mexican horror film The Untamed also arrives in cinemas today. If the name doesn't ring a bell, you might have heard it referred to as the Alien Tentacle Sex Partner Swap Movie from this year's Sydney Film Festival and Melbourne International Film Festival. In this dark and bizarre sci-fi drama, a troubled married couple, played by Ruth Ramos and Jesus Meza, track down a meteorite and encounter the mysterious creature. Despite sounding like the film should be confined to the more dubious internet forums or anime series, the film instead comments on homosexuality, sexual repression, and violence. The Untamed was selected to compete for the Golden Lion at the 73rd Venice International Film Festival, and Amat Escalante won the Silver Lion for his direction. Finally, also out today is Ingrid Goes West, the new film starring Elizabeth Olsen and Aubrey Plaza, which looks at our obsession with social media. Jess took this one in, so were you hashtag blessed to see it? Yes, Charlie, I thought this was double tapping good. We all get that warm and fuzzy feeling when someone likes one of your carefully curated and filtered posts on social media. But for Ingrid Thorburn, a like or comment is more than the validation by a complete stranger. It's the spark of friendship and obsession. If Single White Female was a comedy set today, then Ingrid Goes West is it. Aubrey Plaza plays Ingrid, whom after a brief court-ordered stint in a psychiatric facility following an Instagram-induced incident, takes her backpack full of cash and her need for a new start and a new Instagram handle, West, all the way to California to stalk, <clears throat> I mean meet, her latest WCW, or Woman Crush Wednesday, Taylor Sloan, played by Elizabeth Olsen. A perfect day for a perfect wedding. Hashtag perfect. Happy to be sharing this day with all my favorite humans. Hashtag blessed. Is this real? Hashtag no filter. A perfect day for a perfect wedding. Yep, that's how we roll. Ingrid. Congratulations. <laughs> Are you insane? 
Anything else I need to know about Ingrid? To surprise absolutely no one, it turns out that what we see in social media isn't real. It always takes a couple dozen shots, the perfect lighting, a filter, and perhaps into Photoshop to get that perfect post. Those abs aren't real. She doesn't actually drink that detox tea in real life, and behind that impossibly perfect sunset kiss, he's cheating on her. So the lies Ingrid tells in order to weasel her way into Taylor's life grow and the higher they climb, the harder they fall, particularly when Taylor's drug-addled dropkick brother gets involved. First time feature writer-director Matt Spicer has made a great film here. It's funny, smart and a cutting satire, just not cutting enough. It's aware of itself superficially, but not nearly as deep enough as it should to make any real or lasting impact. The cast is, however, fantastic with Olsen and Plaza creating magic together. But ultimately, I needed this movie to be more and say something more than simply social media is fake, addictive and cyclical. It's an engaging and entertaining watch that falters at its conclusion, leaving it unable to cross the line into remarkable. But I'm still giving it three and a half stars. This movie was um, way better than I expected it to be. Um, I think we talked a few weeks ago about how hard it is to make really good movies about social media. And this was like really, um, I guess this one just focused on Instagram, but um, yeah, like super effective and um, great acting. And um, Oshie Jackson Jr., um, Ice Cube's son, he was great in this. I thoroughly enjoyed this and particularly for like for a first time um, film, like a film from a first time filmmaker. Yeah, super, super slick movie. It does have a very appealing cast. The cast is just great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Aubrey Plaza. Like, she is so awesome to watch on screen. I loved her in uh, Safety Not Guaranteed. Like, that is mm. one of my favorite movies from the past couple and she's of years. Uh, bloody it's just... wonderful in the little hours. She's just absolutely bloody wonderful. Uh, and if anyone's seen her in Legion, the TV show yeah. Legion. Oh, she's is, so good. Um, she's yeah, she's awesome. She's awesome. But she never plays sane or normal people yeah. <laughs> or no. like socially functional. Or people with like a range of people. emotions, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this one does definitely fit into her wheelhouse. Which, I mean, she obviously she does do it very well, but this is definitely, you know, an Aubrey Plaza role and film. And she did produce it as well. It should be, it should be added. I just think Aubrey Plaza, this is really good sort of mug for playing like unhinged women roles that, you know, have a, a, you know, a bit of darkness to them and stuff. And when you put her opposite, like Elizabeth Olsen, who has this kind of like really sunny face, like it's just like really, this movie has like a really interesting, you know, dynamic between the two female leads. Yeah. Does Billy Magnuson, who plays uh, Elizabeth Olsen's brother, does he take his shirt off at any point? Yes, he does. Good, good. I'm there. Isn't, isn't that in the trailer? <laughs> I haven't watched the trailer because I don't watch trailers unless you make me watch trailers. <laughs> and this looks like a good film, so I didn't watch the trailer. <laughs> the hearing that O'Shea Jackson Jr. is really good in it is is makes me also really yeah. excited to see it because he's also very pretty. He plays this kind of like um, <laughs> uh, massive Batman fan. So uh, yeah. all his lines of dialogue are kind of like, you know, he has like a lot of Batman puns and, and whatnot. But uh, the, yeah, the guy has this really sort of nice kind of goofy charm about him. Um, I've only seen him in Straight Outta Compton which I didn't really like, and I thought he was kind of shit in. But, um, yeah, this movie, I, I thought he was kind of like... <laughs> he was um, playing his dad. Yeah. <laughs> you were so shit at playing your dad. Like, how do you really know the character? Like, well, you should have hung out with him more or something. I don't know. But um, he's, uh, he's a lot better in this. Like, he just actually has, like, that kind of um, kind of easygoing charisma. and um, His character's really fun and interesting, yeah. and charismatic, and it's great. I can't think of any kind of weak performances in this movie, though. Like, I think it was across the board, it was like pretty no, strong. No, no one's a weak performance. I did mention in my online review um, that I think there was some slight miscasting, and I'm going to put a name to it. Um, I absolutely, I do, I love Wyatt Russell to death, and I think he's doing great work these days. I just don't think he fit this film. Yeah, I felt he, that about a few films that he's been in. I felt similarly yeah. about him in Everybody Wants Some. I thought, oh, you're not oh, quite right for that. this. Yeah, this one's a bit off. Um, he plays Elizabeth Olsen's husband, and he's really great. But again, I don't think a portion of that miscasting isn't actually his fault. I think the um, the character is a little bit... It sort of heads in the wrong direction. Yeah. Like when they start, when all the layers of these people's like sort of fake and phony social uh, media lives starts to show, you sort of sit there and go, I don't understand why those two people are together. But um, yeah, that's nitpicking, I guess. How would you have made the, the message a bit stronger? Like where do you, where do you I guess, think the, think the film fell down in terms of, you know, not being, um, not being deep enough? It travels along really well and really beautifully. And um, 
and I think the relationship between Elizabeth Olsen and Aubrey Plaza's character is great but then it sort of gets to that that last hurdle at the end where you're like okay I hear what you're saying and now Mm. I just need you to get us you know over that finish line and I just think it falls flat and you're like oh you did the you went the easy route and you kind of went a bit cliche and I I saw where you were going but I was so hoping you wouldn't go there and you did and you know and the credits start to roll and you're like well Mm. well I guess that's that I think there's like a point where they actually sort of spell the message out in the dialogue like um without kind of getting into spoiler territory yeah. like there's like an argument and they sort of like and then the dialogue becomes like pretty unsubtle i don't know there's like a that's kind of like a you know fair chunk into the movie so there's like plenty of good stuff before it starts kind of you know i'm stumbling a little bit oh absolutely absolutely i kind of really like these um you know these type of movies where it's like you know an outsider insinuating their way into like the cool group type of thing it's like a you know a talented mr ripley or yeah love and death on long island yeah. or um more than Kala or whatever um this is the same kind of thing We're and <laughs> no, no, because... Mean girls. Uh, um. <laughs> Absolutely. <yeah>. Clueless. <laughs> but um, yeah, this movie kind of, I, I'm a huge fan of the talent of Mr. Ripley and this movie actually kind of gave me like a Mr. Ripley for the for 2017 social media kind of vibe. That is a damn big yeah, compliment. Yeah. To equate something to the talent of Mr. Ripley <laughs> is a big compliment. That is a fucking great film. <laughs> Jake doesn't hand out copulent seasons. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Jake says talented Mr. Ripley. I say single white female. If you want to make up your own mind, you can find my full review at maketheswitch.com.au. It's in cinemas now, so go see Ingrid Goes West. All right, now let's check out the upcoming films in our trailer wrap. Here's Black Panther. My son, it is your time. Show me my respect and bow down. You get to decide what kind of king you are going to be. Don't freeze. I never freeze. I waited my entire life for this. The world's gonna start over. I'm gonna burn it all. What happens now determines what happens to the rest of the world. It's actually quite fun talking about this trailer after having already talked about Thor Ragnarok because it feels like it's a continuation of the same positive uh direction that marvel appears to be taking i will literally see anything ryan coogler makes after i mean fruitvale station is brilliant but after creed i was like i will follow you into a fucking anywhere mate like that was astounding and i have to admit watching this trailer it was it's sexy as fuck like it's just it's (laughs) slick it has the best cast like it's just got people in yeah, it. Yeah, you like Michael B. Jordan. Too, oh don't you? God, I could, I would let Michael B. Jordan do terrible Speaking things of to me. Um, but like, <laughs> it's also like you've got like Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman is you know a relatively safe, solid choice to play the lead. But you know, Michael B. Jordan, Lupita Nyong'o, um, Daniel Kaluuya, um, Angela Bassett, Forrest Whitaker. Like it's just Sterling K. Brown. Mm. It's just in terms of an African American cast, it's kind of spectacular. A, that we can see a cast of this caliber brought together for a major Hollywood film. Even more so that it's a major Hollywood film that's a superhero film and that the director himself is an African-American director. The fact that they've gone for this level of uh, fidelity and actually listened to the fact that there is a gaping hole within their franchise of um, representation and equality... It's just so exciting. Like, I just think everything about Black Panther just seems... I could not have... I would have not watched this trailer and I still would have been excited about it. Um, and <laughs> after Creed, we know that he can shoot a fucking action sequence. Bilbo and Gollum, back, like, back together oh, again. Oh, yes! Reunited. The, the, yeah. the, the token white people in the film of Bilbo and Gollum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we may finally work out within the, within the Marvel franchise what their actual purpose is, because I still don't know why they're in there, but sure. <laughs> All will be revealed. But how would you feel if you're Michael B. Jordan and you've made Fruitvale Station and you've made Creed and then this director comes along and goes, yes, I've been put in charge of a Marvel film with a, uh, with a black protagonist and you're Michael B. Jordan, you're like, fuck yeah. And then they're like, and we're casting Chadwick Boseman. <laughs> Chadwick Boseman, like... <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> I'm like, no, you get to be like the next guy well, down. Originally, like, oh. Ava Devaney was supposed to direct Black Panther, and she left the project because of creative differences with Marvel. And so then after, so this this film was kind of in limbo for a while, and I think Chadwick Boseman had already been cast because of Civil War. And then off the back mm. of Creed, 
because the industry was just so shocked by Creed because it was just a film that no one saw coming and was so exceptionally well directed. That's when they went to Ryan Coogler. And I think Michael B. Jordan's involvement in the film is because of Ryan Coogler being the director. And also, it's a great trailer. I didn't feel like I lost anything by watching this trailer, which, you know, after last week's discussion yeah. is a big deal. I'm pumped and excited for it. But I am surprised by how flashy it looks. It almost it's almost like um like Doctor Strange but set in Africa somewhere. Like it's very it's almost very sci-fi, very colorful, very CG, very um technology laden sort of set in this beautiful like oh that's not what I was expecting. I have to admit with the exception of maybe there are sections of Doctor Strange which I'm not that fond of, but there are bits I was pretty impressed by. The the stranger Marvel films have been generally been the best. The ones that take a style and go for it. The generic ones like, you know, the as much as it's a charming, the original Iron Man film um, and the awful Avengers films and like all the very generic ones. The best one, the ones I love the most are all the, the first two Captain America films because, you know, period piece and 70s spy drama and Guardians of the Galaxy films, which, hold, which are very, uh, like enthusiastically embrace their sci-fi roots and... So I think the Marvel franchise is better when it actually does just go for these weirder, um, much more interesting and braver uh, aesthetic textural choices. Mm. You can thank the style not just to Ryan Coogler, but um, and this is really interesting too in discussing the whole African-American uh, majority cast uh it's actually the first marvel film with a female cinematographer rachel morrison oh, who really? has lens this particular film yeah so it's actually really interesting in that regard too and she shot fruitvale station so she's worked with um ryan coogler i just looked her up because i was like really that's actually her credits are pretty fucking impressive yeah she's got a really good list of films behind her um she did dope uh she oh, did how good's uh, dope a Mudblood, which is already can be considered an Oscar contender, which is coming up. That's really exciting. Oh, good on you. I can't believe I'm actually saying nice things about Marvel. Go back three years and you'd hear me being like, <laughs> fucking Marvel, fucking blight on the face of cinema. And now they actually are kind of making yeah. clever decisions, good decisions. Yeah, but you definitely, you look at Deadpool, you look at the, um, obviously we just discussed it all earlier, Thor Ragnarok, and you look at this trailer for Black Panther, and Marvel are definitely loosening the reins mm. a bit, and mm. it's paying mm. off. Only a good thing. And, yeah, yeah. and people are getting yeah. so excited again. Like, these, these, this franchise is over 10 years old now, and so and there's so many of them, and they're starting to get a little bit on the tired side, and now they've sat there and gone, we've got to revamp them all, and we've got to bring people, like, them. <laughs> They're not exactly losing money. They have a license to print money, but you know they were in the they were heading in that direction, and they're, now they're sat there and gone. Let's bring in new and exciting mm. filmmakers and let them go nuts with like a little bit of guidance from us, like staying within the the lines, but coloring in whatever color you want. And it's it's paying off, and it's really exciting again. All of a sudden, it looks like they're playing a long game. Finally, you start to go, oh, maybe these films will actually have a place in a few years' time. Um, maybe they are going to start becoming cinema because that's really what they never were. Like they were just kind of fun popcorn movies. Maybe they're starting to go, oh, this is a medium we can play in. Let's start playing. Well, you can get excited about Black Panther when it hits Australian cinemas on the 15th of February, 2018. Now here's Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread starring Daniel Day-Lewis. May I warn you of something? My brother can feel cursed that love is doomed for him. I don't like the fabric. Maybe one day you'll change your taste. Maybe I like my own taste. Just enough to get you into trouble. Perhaps I'm looking for trouble. Stop! There is an air of quiet death in this house. You're not cursed. You're loved by me. Stop playing this game. What game? What precisely is the nature of my game? All your rules and your clothes and all this money and everything is a game. This was an ambush. Stop! Are you sent here to ruin my evening? possibly my entire life. Stop it! Whatever you do, do it carefully. Well, we've heard precious little about this film since it was announced. In fact, I think we only got the title of it a week ago. Um, and again, it was another one of those films that I would have happily just not bothered to have ever seen a trailer to be excited about. Paul Thomas Anderson is easily one of the most exciting American filmmakers working today. Uh, There'll Be Blood is a masterpiece. The Master is incredible. You know, his previous films, Magnolia, Boogie Nights. Uh, I even loved Inherent Vice as well, which I know was not a particularly popular film, but I loved it for its grace and for its ridiculousness. 
But even with knowing very little just from watching this trailer, it's beautifully shot. It's beautifully paced. You almost know nothing about it. Uh, and it's also a little out, possibly a last chance to see Daniel Day-Lewis on screen. And arguably his best performance on screen was with Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood. So based on that alone and the possibility of a Johnny Greenwood score, yeah, I'm in. I'm completely in. As much as, you know, we've been sitting here wondering what the fuck this film is for such a long time. It's nice to be able to go, oh, we're seeing this great trailer for this exciting film and we're going to see it very, very soon. Because I think it's due in the States before the end of the year to qualify for Oscar season. Uh, and since it's a very quiet Oscar season, I'm sure it will do very well. Uh, and then hopefully will not be will not be long with us. So, yeah, very high on my must-see list. Yes, indeed, Daniel. Phantom Thread is out in Australian cinemas on the 1st of February 2018. Now let's check out the first look of I, Tonya. America. They want someone to love They want someone to hate. And the haters always say, Tanya, tell the truth. There's no such thing as truth. I mean, it's bullshit. The 90s was such a magical time and they gave us so many great stories of really fucked up people, i.e. OJ Simpson <laughs> and um, Tonya Harding. I remember this. This happened in 1994. I remember this story. It dominated such a huge run of news feeds and newspapers and whatever. And, you know, there's been documentaries and things about it, but I can't believe it's taken this long to make a film about it. And with Margot Robbie um, as Tonya Harding, I'm mm. very excited. Not only that, but this is the first film that she's produced. So she's starring it and producing it. And it's a very independent film. There was a long time where yes. no one was sure whether who was going to pick it up for release. Yeah, I'm excited. Everyone keeps talking about it. It's yeah. done the festival. It's done the round of festivals. And everyone keeps saying how, you know, everyone's going to come out of this um, viewing Tonya Harding very differently. That Margot Robbie is an Oscar contender. Yeah, which is interesting. That's something no one would have thought about a couple of months ago. It, and all of a sudden, it's just bubbled out of nowhere, this yeah. this little I mean, film. thank fuck. And it looks finally fantastic something too, and... appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> Like, it's just getting pretty dire know, for a minute there. It was like, you know, the landscape was Dunkirk and Call Me By Your Name and it was just this dead silence of everything else. It's like, ah, uh, and praying for Get Out. But it's nice that this, yeah, we're nice surprise to see this kind of appear. <laughs> And it's great that it's not just another biography. It's like it's got a bit of a nice, funny twist to it as well, which seems. It like has a point really of cool. view. It has a point of view, which is yeah. great. And but it's such a sick, twisted little story. And in you know, <laughs> under the umbrella of figure skating, it's so great. It's like when ballerinas start clawing at each other. And it's I don't so remember good. the story of Tonya Harding, so I enjoy the fact that I don't know anything oh. about this, and I don't want to. Oh, it's a similar funny. thing to I had when I watched <laughs> The People vs. O.J. Simpson, of going, I don't, I remember the name, but I don't remember the actual event and being able to discover it through what sounds like and from the, from the trailer the way the trailer is cut it looks like it has great energy and dynamism and if the film from all reviews sounds like it has the same plus again another film that has a fucking great cast Margot Robbie Sebastian Stan Alison Janney yeah. Julianne Nicholson and Bobby Cannavale who's just one of the sexiest men that's ever lived I think personally <laughs> he, he's, he's taken Daniel I know he's Mrs. <laughs> um, he is Mr. Rose Byrne <laughs> Not only is it Margot Robbie who's involved in this film, uh, obviously a fantastic Australian, but it's directed by Craig Gillespie, who is an Australian director. Mm. Um, Lars and the Real Girl. Really, Representing yeah, Lars and the Real Girl was one of his films. He did a couple of bad Disney films, uh, Finest Hours and Million Dollar Arm. But he also did a bunch of stuff like uh, United States of Tara episodes, yeah. which is like, one of my all-time favorite uh, TV series. It's, it's damn good brilliant. show. Oh, it's so good. So that's kind of exciting too. And this is his first uh, kind of getting back to independent films and uh, since since his Disney time. So I'm, I'm excited by that fact too. Um, just to be like the sour note on this one, um, this movie looks pretty <gasps> cool. That's what you I'm do. Gonna have to That's be... you walk in and create anarchy. <laughs> I'm going to have to be negative. I'm the sour <laughs> note for this film. Star, What's your favourite Jake? French film, Daniel? <laughs> Jake, Cat Amongst Pigeons. Uh, this movie is also written by a guy called Stephen Rogers, who's written Hope Floats, yeah. Kate and Leopold, and P.S. I Love You. Um oh, yeah. Oh, so this is kind of like his. <laughs> what is no, no. So this is like his first kind of dark movie, I guess. You're missing some gems as well, like Love the Coopers and Stepmom uh, that he wrote. <laughs> so yeah, Wait, you're right. He, wrote he does Step have a Mom really shocking. In Susan Sarand and Julia Roberts Stepmom. As in yeah, 1998 <gasps> Stepmom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you 
Do you really? <laughs> so yeah, you found the weakness in this uh, in this film. That's for sure. I'm not going to say those are bad films, but I'm like t- <laughs> like tonally. I mean, you can. What will you say? I could, but that, yeah, you know. No one would argue. Yeah, yeah, but like sort of tonally, do these movies really go <laughs> with Itonia? Like Itonia is supposed to be like it is pitched to me. I I think I assume it's it's kind of like a dark drama with with a bit of comedy and stuff involved. But it was on the blacklist for a while. It was, and so it got a lot of positive responses from being on the blacklist as an unproduced screen play so it like yeah. it, it was it was another reason why it was nice to see it actually happen was oh it, you know it'd be so, yeah maybe, about for a maybe while. it's actually a gem maybe it's actually something that he's written that is something he's actually proud of yeah i guess well i guess like sort of you know diamonds are formed by compressing a lot of shit so um this could be um his, his <laughs> diamond <laughs> oh dear. Um, and, but sorry as you mentioned before charlie um craig gillespie pretty awesome director um yeah. i think there is Pretty good chance this could be good. Yeah, the source material is so rich. This is one of the most oh, infamous yeah. sporting stories in history. Not in ice skating history, not in 90s history, not in Olympic history. In history, period. It's so good. So, oh, so, good. so much so more excited. excited now. Yeah, so <laughs> excited. <laughs> Well, we can find out if I, Tonya, is that diamond when it hits Australian cinemas on the 15th of February 2018. That's actually the same day as Black Panther. And finally, let's take a look at Snake Out of Compton. Yeah, you heard right. Snake Out of Compton. If I can activate the reptilian skin cells in this newly had snake, the potential for growth would be nearly unlimited. It worked! It worked! Welcome to Compton, California. In order to work these streets, you gotta be these streets, huh? Everybody in this town thinks they're a rapper. You think I care about you kids and your crunk dubstep Bieber believer bullshit? We got the biggest gig of our lives tomorrow. My snake, has anyone seen my snake? A mutated snake. Oh, what the fuck? My invention supercharged it with unstable molecules and now it's growing at an uncontrollable rate. Holy Mary J. Blah. What you're saying is, is big enough to eat this Twinkie. It's not a big Twinkie. My ding dong is bigger than that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! There's a snake terrorizing Compton. You gotta help me capture it so I can run more tests. We catch this snake and I'll be famous. We talking about the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> I gotta be honest. Go wild, Jack. Go, Jack. This already looks better to me than um, that new uh, hip hop movie "Love Beats and Rhymes" by uh, RZA <laughs> from Wu Tang Clan and Azalea Banks. If I had the choice of seeing Snake Out of Compton based on this trailer, and you're a big Wu Tang fan, exactly. I'm a huge Wu Tang fan, um, but that movie looks absolutely shit. And Snake Out of Compton, <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, it's it's got a snake. There's some, you know, DJs. There's um, yeah, there's a bit of hip hop there. I think this could be an Oscar Stop contender. trying, Jake. Just no. stop trying to defend this one. <laughs> Throughout this entire trailer, my mouth did not move an inch upwards into a smile-like direction. I was just watching this going, why? How do films like this find funding? I don't understand. This isn't funny. This I don't think it clever. needed much of a budget, Jess. Oh, my God. Well, someone um... has to pay for the CGI snake. We also <laughs> spent a bit of time talking on this segment about uh, well-made trailers. Like, There's a lot of times we've talked about, oh, this is a particularly well-made trailer. This is an example of a really fucking badly made trailer. Like, I couldn't follow anything with this. It was too long. It was... Oh, it's just... I Yeah, yeah. It's bad, bad publicity. It's really long, isn't it? It's like nearly three Yeah, minutes. and I feel like I yeah. still don't know anything about the film. It took, takes about a minute and a half before the fucking snake turns up. I'm not coming to watch this film to watch some fucking rappers in Compton. I watched that film. <laughs> it went for three hours and I was very satisfied by it. I've come to see a giant fucking snake eat people... Because that's what the title promises. I didn't go to see Snakes on a Plane to go watch a distillation about the experiences of flight attendants and what flying is like and the interpersonal relationships people on the plane. I came to watch fucking Samuel Jackson kill a bunch of snakes on a plane. I'm going to see a film called Snake out of Compton. I want to see a fucking snake eat people in Compton. Took a minute before it turned up, and yeah. I was not happy. <laughs> I'm getting a real Danae Villeneuve vibe from this um, this movie. I think it's going to be like oh. um, that movie. Um, it's gonna be like enemy. It's gonna be like <laughs> you need this guy is like just stop. like talking about the snake for the entire movie. <laughs> you trash. <laughs> gonna be talking about the snake for the entire movie, and then uh, you know five minutes before like you know the credits roll, one of the guys will sort of like walk into the this music studio where they're cutting some fresh beats, and they'll open the door up, and the snake will be there. 
and that's and then like roll the credits and that'll be the end of the movie i don't think they have much budget for um a lot of snake in this movie somehow i think it's um the marketing's a bit deceptive to set us up for the sequel obviously <laughs> yeah. what we're anticipating is a cinematic experience on par with arrival and blade runner 2049 great <laughs> yep sure you trash you filth <laughs> You know what? I I actually really disappointed Brent isn't here for this particular podcast because you know what he would be saying right now. Oh, God. I know that this is one of those films that they came up with the title and then came up with the concept of the film (laughs) afterwards. Like, Snake out of Compton. They put snakes on a plane and straight out of Compton together into a really bad film. And I think that's actually... (laughs) I honestly thought it was... When I saw the trailer, the name come up of the film, I went, is that a joke? Because it's a really good pun. Like, that's what you get a Compton. I'm like, that's a good pun. <laughs> it should never be made into a film. And why is this even getting a considering a c- cinema release in the US? It should just go straight to the Sci Fi Channel where Sharknado films are. Why is this film getting any airtime on this podcast period? There were several trailers out this week, and this we chose to talk about Snake because out of Compton for reasons I'm I, still not look, sure. Personally, I felt when I suggested it, and I will admit I suggested it, it was because I went. <laughs> I feel like we just need a joke. <laughs> just to throw a joke in there. Let's yes, acknowledge the joke. fact this film exists and that this is the state of cinema in 2017. Or 2018, which is when it's scheduled to be released oh, yeah, in, the, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the US. We have a film called Snake Out of Compton. Hey, it can't be any worse than like, you know, the scary it movie could. franchise or, you know, any of the spin yeah, actually, of it's, it's honestly it on par worse. with those. This no, trailer I was. Think, no. I, think this is, I think this is it. No. I think this will exceed your expectations. This is Charlie. the end of days. <laughs> Not, this is what Revelation spoke of. <laughs> Revelation spoke of this. I'm sorry. I would still prefer to sit through this particular film than Geostorm again. So, really? Charlie, I'm, we got through yeah. how long and you didn't I'm... mention it and now you've mentioned it. <laughs> and now for the third time, we have mentioned Geostorm on this podcast. Yeah, I don't believe you, Charlie. You still gave Geostorm one and a half stars. And I gave you good reasons as to why, but we won't go through that again. Good reasons or just reasons? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I reckon you should take away at least half a star because there, yes. was no, there were no snakes in it. No googly-eyed giant snakes eating people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Retroactively reduced its rating by half a star because there were no snakes. Really bad CGI googly-eyed snakes. Yeah. The only thing more horrifying than the snake in this trailer is how bad the overacting is. Well, I can make no promises that Snake Out of Compton will be hitting Australian cinemas anytime soon, but to check out all those trailers and more, head to youtube.com forward slash make the switch AU. With Halloween around the corner, the crew at Switch is delving deep into the recesses of their souls to bring you some of their scary movie picks. An old school classic, a modern classic, and a creepy film you can watch with the family. So, old school classic, I'm going to say Suspiria. Um, uh, Dario Argento, 1977 um, horror film, um, American uh, student goes to Germany. Um, to study ballet and she stumbles on suspicious happenings and uh, but, well, basically like you know a witch's coven and uh, random shit starts happening uh, you know a lot of violence ensues and um, and the movie is just absolutely beautiful like it's, it's just um, delicious uh, Dario Argento is like the master of um, oversaturated colors and um, uh, it has that sort of really awesome um, um, score by uh, the band Goblin yeah, um, there's kind of nothing else like it. I remember the first time I watched it, I was really stunned mm. by... I mean, it almost has no narrative. The script is pointless. And it, there are moments where it just sits yeah. and meditates with these images and these sounds. And it's extraordinary. It's just There's just nothing quite like mm. it. Also, it's just had a 4K restoration, which I think is going to be on a stra- Blu-ray yes. Australia at the end of November. And we've got Luca Guadagnino's mm. uh, reimagining next year with a cast that has like T- Tilda Swinton and a whole bunch of other ridiculously impressive and exciting women. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is so good. All right, Charlie, what's your classic film? Oh, this was a really tough one because um, there are so many good ones out there. I mean, we were kind of deliberating over this before the podcast and <laughs> the list we had was just immense. Um, but... I have a great amount of respect for Hitchcock's films. A lot of them are freaky as fuck. They play with your mind. Um, but if you're going to go with a horror, I think the best of the best is probably the classic Psycho. 1960, Janet Lee is 
pretty much superb in it. Um, it rewrote the rules of horror. It's it's a defining film. It's distinctive in its editing. It's distinctive in its screenplay. Um, it's it was unlike anything that had been produced before it. It's also incredibly creepy. It's basically a work of modern art. Like it 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 feels. I mean, it was. I think it was mm. not long after the film opened. They actually showed it at the Museum of Modern Art in or the Guggenheim in New York. And it feels like that. It's it's, it's almost whenever you think of Psycho, wow. it almost you forget it exists because it exists on a different plane, on a different level. It's just so astoundingly singular and feels like it's more than a film. I think it's I think it's perfect. I think Psycho is a perfect film. And I did also forget to mention like Anthony Perkins in it is just yeah, genius so as well. Like his his portrayal of that character characters is is just something else so yeah i like i like psycho for my classic and jess so while doing some research uh for this segment i stumbled across a term that's given to people such as myself which are people that like halloween movies but don't like scary movies because we're um wusses and it's called a halloweenie <laughs> so i'm proudly i am proudly loudly and proudly a halloweenie and uh so my um nomination for a classic uh, halloween film if you want to call it is ghostbusters the 1984 version although if you think about it the 2016 version was fucking terrifying because it was so bad um no i'm going i'm going old school i'm going original I'm going bill murray dan Aykroyd, 1984 Ghostbusters. It's why well, you wouldn't really call it scary or terrifying or horrific, but I did find when you it was came out the year I was born, so I saw it when I was very very young. And um, the ghost in the first scene at the library, oh, the yeah. library, yeah, ghost, scary. yeah, yeah. She, I, she, I can see she that. She freaked me out as a little kid. Yeah, but other than that, you love Slimer and you laugh along with everyone else, and it's a great movie. It's a classic. What's that great one liner that happens in the in the mayor's office? I can never remember. It's my favorite moment in that film. It's... Oh, and says yes, this man has no dick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, that one. <laughs> Yeah, you would have saved the lives of millions of registered voters. Ah, uh, yeah, he says yes. It's true. This man has no dick. Ah, <laughs> oh, that Bill Murray cracks me up. <laughs> and Daniel, what do you got? Well, it wouldn't be me if I didn't go for something a little bit odd. Ugh. The first time I saw this film, I was about thirteen, and it's Peter Weir's nineteen seventy five Australian masterpiece picnic at hanging rock Ooh, yeah. um the first time i saw it yeah so i would have been about creepy. i would have been 13 years old i watched it by myself i picked it from the library because i thought it was one of those like merchant ivory like, romantic dramas <laughs> and i for some reason i was in the mood for one of those as a 13 year old and so i was at my grandmother's house we, i was living in the country at the time and my grandmother lived in this very big old queenslander would, would have been about a hundred and something years old and i was sitting in the dark by myself at night watching this film on this tiny tv and it scared the living daylights out of me. It took me, yes. it took, it honestly took me days to get over this film because it was so unsettling. Um, for those of you who don't know it, it's basically, I think, the best film this country has ever produced. A group of girls from a, a girls' college in Mount Macedon in the year 1900 on Valentine's Day go to Hanging Rock, which is a uh, geological anomaly up near Mount Macedon in Victoria. And three of the girls and one of their teachers disappear. And nobody, it's a true well, story. it's no one's quite sure if it is a true story or not. There's evidence that suggests that it might be, and evidence suggests that, that it might not be. But it's framed as a true story, and the premise itself is already quite unusual. But the film itself is kind of a perfect encapsulation of a nightmare. It's beautifully shot. It's incredibly unsettling. The score is creepy as hell. All the performances are this kind of yeah. heightened awareness of the fact that it's. The, it's not played as realism and i it took me i can't i can't watch it at night i can't read the book at night so my classic is peter weir's picking a hang rock don't watch it at night it'll fuck with you it fucked with me um, getting on to the modern classics um this one um yeah pretty tricky to to pick a modern classic um not for like you know lack of choice but there's just like so many i mean in terms of like horror movies but in terms of classics like yeah uh, so i went to south korea in terms of what I was looking for and um, The Wailing. Um, it's like a fairly recent movie by um, uh, Nan Hong Jing. The, the, basically, the, the synopsis is like a, a policeman um, investigating like a series of illnesses and deaths um, in uh, a small village on a mountaintop in South Korea. You know, stumbles onto some pretty hectic uh, supernatural shit. 
a really, really creepy movie. And um, the director's office also gone through and like edited it uh, quite cleverly. So um, it's never really too clear what's um, going on. Um, as we were saying before about uh, Agento and Suspiria, like stuff just happens and it's freaky. And then you kind of move on to this next scene and, and something even freakier happens. And it just kind of gradually builds up this sense of um, sense of dread. But once again, this isn't kind of like a gore fest or whatever. So it's not on Suspiria's level in terms of violence, but um, it's just like this really oppressive, uh, creepy um, atmosphere. And a really sort of a, an absolute gut punch of, a, of an ending as well. So yeah, if you um, need to be scared, The Wailing, pretty awesome movie. Charlie, what do you got? So for my pick, uh, I went with something I saw at the 2008 Sydney Film Festival. Uh, it was not at all what I was expecting uh, from a, from this particular film, and it, it works quite well given uh, The Snowman's recent release. Directed by Thomas Alfredson, Let the Right One In. Uh, this amazing, underrated vampire, dark, but very dark, but very so disturbing so beautiful drama. and so moving amazingly shot it's got a pretty um yeah it's got a nice little love story in there as well there is it's so basically it's this young boy oscar who is very lonely and uh very miscared for and essentially this very mysterious girl moves to his neighborhood and uh they form this lovely friendship slash relationship but it turns out she loves murdering and sucking blood out of people in a For very, sure. very violent way. Uh, some a fact that he comes to discover. So she spoiler, she is a it's, vampire. Yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty extraordinary. It's so <laughs> sweet. You don't expect it to be anywhere near as moving or as sweet as it is. Which I think is why when you get to those really violent parts, mm. they are so much more extreme because you're coming off that like really lovely uh, romance between these two children um, and you, you then see her, her stalking a guy and snapping his neck. It should be said that the, the vampire element of this film is very underplayed. Yeah. It's not it's not, a fan, it's not a fantastical film at all. It's, um, yeah, it's just very creepy. It, it ain't no Twilight. That's yeah. sure <laughs> it was really fascinating when it came out because it came out at the same time as Twilight. So it was kind of while the multiplexes were kind of being riddled with the twilight phenomenon on an art house level there was this beautiful gem of a film that turned up it's beautifully mm. beautifully made yeah I, I recommend watching let the right one in and jess what's your modern classic all right the halloweeny comes in for the kill i'm going for 1995 laugh if you will casper it's got <laughs> bill pullman in it it's got christina ricci in it it's got a bunch of ghosts in it and it's <laughs> awesome and i will also go so far the as friendliest to say ghost you've that ever seen yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, good. it's got it's a little Richard song in it. And I would go so far as to say that this film was quite possibly Jess's sexual awakening because when that what? camera pans around <laughs> to show the audience very, very hot Devin Sawa yeah. walking down those stairs in yeah. the puffy pirate shirt, oh my God, Jess felt something <laughs> a little dirty. I'm with <laughs> I yeah, and not only that, and you might be sitting there going, "It's not scary. It's not Halloween. Bullshit." Yes, it has ghosts in it, and the climax of the film <laughs> climax takes place <laughs> at a Halloween party. Boom! Modern classic coming at you from the from the Halloween. I support you, Jess. I support you in all things. I r- really loved this film as a kid. I really, uh, really, yeah. it's really charming and really lovely. It's re- and it's directed. I love it as an adult still. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I agree with you. I was pretty taken aback by Devin yeah. Sawa walking through down the stairs as a child, even though I wasn't aware of my, um, you know, <laughs> my taste. That might have been an indicator. <laughs> um, and also it's actually like, it's it's kind of, it's a very charming film. Brad Silberling, who directed it, went on to direct the far superior film version of Series of Unfortunate Events. So it has a like a lovely texture to it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, a film. It's, it's fun. It's really funny it has all these nods to past classic films like terminator and stuff like that it's a beautiful story about a father and a daughter after the loss of the wife slash mother and friendship and and it's it's great it's got eric idol in it it's got kathy moriarty plays the villain kathy moriarty yes and it's anyway awesome 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 casper and daniel what do you got well I'm going to go for a blockbuster and it was an unexpected blockbuster, but it's one that um, if Picnic Hang Rock is the scariest film I've ever seen, I would probably say that this is a very close second. Um, And that is bizarrely Paranormal Activity. I looked up Paranormal Activity just before 
And I couldn't even look at the IMDb page because the film genuinely creeps the fuck out of me so much. I think it's an unacknowledged modern horror classic. What it does them playing with the form is so fascinating. For those who don't know it, the concept is basically this young couple believe that there is a ghost in their house. And so what the husband does is he buys a camera and he sets it up in the bedroom and presses record and films what happens in the bedroom that night. I'm actually getting like... I'm getting chills even just thinking about it because this film fucked me up so much. <laughs> the genius of the film, though, I mean, the script is not very... It was made on a, on a budget and the script isn't particularly great. It kind of hits the boxes. But the genius it was of the made film... for a couple of hundred thousand bucks. Yeah, nothing, but the genius yeah. of the film is, is, is the conceit, which is that when it's filming at night, the camera doesn't move. And we as horror fans, as people who watch horror films, are used to the camera leading us towards where our eyes should go. So we're, we're, the camera will, you know, pan across and show us something or zoom in and show us something. With paranormal activity, the camera doesn't do that. The camera is inert and observational and completely detached from what you're seeing. And so you, as the film progresses and it becomes progressively more terrifying, your eyes are scanning from left to right on this still image, which increases your heart rate, which increases your sense of anxiety towards the film. And you're constantly trying to work out where a movement's going to happen. And it's not a ghost, it's a demon who is obsessed with the wife. And you can't see it. It's not a film where they show as little as possible. They show nothing. But you can just see the movement of a door, the movement of a sheet. And you can hear as it approaches and walks into the, into the room. And it all kind of culminates in... I'm actually like sitting here looking over my shoulder because this film freaks me out so much. There's a sequence in it that where the film... It's behind you. Sh- don't don't i will not sleep tonight thinking i shouldn't have talked about this film there's actually there's there's one sequence in it where the film kind of explodes into complete horrific anarchy and i saw it at the cinema on a date at the end of this scene i realized i was sitting on my date's lap i was gripping his arm and i was crying because i was so terrified and i love horror films i watch heaps of horror films and i've ne- i've never had that reaction to a film before i watch maybe once every two or three years just to kind of rem- remind myself about why i was so impressed by it but yeah it scared the living shit out of me so yeah i think paranormal activity modern classic do not watch by yourself do not expect to sleep at night i did not um, so a creepy film you can watch the entire family. So uh, a family friendly horror movie uh, you can watch on Halloween right now. Yes, the more up Daniel's alley. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> last time we did the podcast, I talked a little bit about uh, this guy called Fred Decker, who directed a movie called Night of the Creeps, which was a pretty goofy, fun horror movie. Um, he also directed a movie called uh, Monster Squad in when was it 1987. Uh, so Monster Squad is basically like the Goonies versus all the Universal monsters. So you have all the kind of uh, you know teenage archetypes, like the cute uh, fat kid and the tough kid and the nerd and whatever, fighting against Dracula, the Wolfman, you know the Mummy, Frankenstein, uh, in this like small American town over a you know like a magic book. Really good movie. It's more of a horror, like a slightly scary horror adventure movie. Really quotable dialogue. Fred Decker's just like, he's really good with snappy patter and uh, and one-liners. And this movie has tons of them. The fat kid is the best character or the funniest character, I should say. Um, the monsters are actually like really well done. So it's not kind of like an entirely goofy endeavor. Like the monsters are actually kind of like well made up and kind of creepy. And there is like some, you know, action, which, you know, can get a bit grisly. But um, I think your family can watch. I think kids would be able to watch this and they won't be too traumatized. Like Frankenstein's fairly likable. Um, they'll they'll get into this, I think. they Yeah. If they wake up screaming and stuff, that's really not my problem. Like <laughs> your kids are weak. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's that's all I got. Uh, Come Monster join Squad. the Halloweeny family. <laughs> um, Charlie, what do you got? So I'm taking you back to 1988 when Beetlejuice came out. Uh, this Yay! film is honestly one of my favorites for its combination of uh, Tim Burton's signature style before it got overused. It is hilarious. It is gross. It is. Uh, musically amazing as well. So basically, it's the story of uh, this married couple, Adam and Barbara, who are played by Gina Davis and an almost unrecognizable, but you totally know it's his voice, Alec Baldwin, who uh, move to this, this house. They then inadvertently die and become ghosts in the house. And this other family moves in. 
And to try and get the family, this incredibly obnoxious family, out, uh, they summon Beetlejuice, who is this disgusting... You've already said it twice. Sleazy. Can I say it one more time? Well, you've got to say it together, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, I, I don't want to test those laws. <laughs> Zeus is the one Michael Keaton turning up into our house unannounced. <gasps> I would love Michael Keaton to sh- turn up unannounced. <laughs> As Beetlejuice? <gasps> oh, he did it. He did it. He did it. You're, you're messing with forces. You don't understand. <laughs> um... But this is, yeah, I just, there's nothing about this film I don't love. It is so cleverly crafted. Um, It has a very young Winona Ryder in it, uh, who is just this amazing goth character. It's got such a good soundtrack from Harry Belafonte, which is just superb. The sequences, the two sequences they do, yeah, Deo (laughs) and Sheikh Senor at the end, uh, which is just the best ending to a film love it love it um yeah there's nothing about this movie i do not adore and it's other than a few vulgar references from the b word um (laughs) (laughs) no you've already said it three times we're all fucked now (laughs) fine Uh, other than than a few vulgar references from beetlejuice (laughs) this is very family friendly um, I'm actually going to go and see this, uh, see Beetlejuice. Uh, it's like playing as a double feature at a cinema near me with uh, oh. The Lost Boys on October 27. Oh, that's, that's at the Orpheum. Awesome. Sure is. Um, Beetlejuice and Lost Boys. I think it should be pretty interesting awesome double, double feature. feature. That is a, that's a cool double feature. Mm. Yeah. That's a very cool double feature. But uh, to see Beetlejuice on the big screen, fuck that. Yeah, I know. Cool. Hey, I just remember like back in the day as well, I had this like massive crush on Winona Ryder in this movie. I was, it was like an age appropriate you know, crush. So, <laughs> yeah, more so than Kathy. <laughs> so good movie. Uh, Jess, what do you got? Um, yeah. Okay. So, out of the movies that I've I've spoken about, I think this one is definitely um, the scariest. Even though we're talking about it in the family friendly section, and I have a little bit of trouble talking about it because it still gives me nightmares. But it's um, so it's about this mum and dad, and they have oh. I'm sorry, I'm struggling. This is your paranormal activity, isn't it? This is your paranormal is. activity. Yeah, so this mum and dad, they they have 12 children. And I'm talking about the movie Cheaper by the Dozen. And it's really scary. And I know you don't really like typically think of Steve Martin in a scary film, but this one is really frightening. And like not everyone can sit through such a film because there are so many children and they're everywhere and they're little monsters. And... Um, it gives me nightmares and like and there's a sequel so it just gets worse there are like more children as with all great horror films there must all be a franchise. Horror films, a franchise so there's like two of them so far and if they make and, a third and one Hillary i don't think i can handle it, it. and it's oh my god it's like yeah Hillary <laughs> Duff's in it and the guy who played superman on tv and so yeah like if you want to get the family together and watch cheaper by the dozen i mean you can but i don't know like it's pretty scary. So, like, happy Halloween, everyone. But, yeah, Cheaper by the Dozen is my recommendation for, like, a really scary film. Okay, Daniel, you go. You're ridiculous. I can't, I can't follow that up. Like, everything seems inadequate now as a, as a recommendation compared to that. Like, really, I'm done. Um, okay, I'm going to go with one of my childhood favourite films, and it is the 1991 classic horror comedy, The Addams Family. Yeah! Uh, it is. It's yeah. look. It's funny. You got really bad reviews when it came out, like really mm. bad. But I just unashamedly fucking love it. It has. Yeah. It's just so much mm. fun. It's so silly. The cast is just divine. Raúl Julia as Gomez is just delicious, and Christopher Lloyd as Uncle Angelica Festa. Angelica Houston. Fuck. And well, no, I'm gonna get to Angelica Houston. That's a oh, separate okay. discussion. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then you have the debut of Christina Ricci, who we've already discussed with Casper. But the best thing about it, apart from the be- the comedy and the direction and the, s- and the production design in the cast, is Angelica Houston as Morticia Adams. She is iconic. Yes. And the greatest thing about her performance is that if you pay attention, in every single shot, there is a light that like specifically lights her eyes. It's like a shadow across her face, and then her eyes are just lit. No matter what the lighting of any scene that her eyes are illuminated to emphasize how mysterious and beautiful she is. So every time she comes on screen, I piss myself laughing. Um, the I, only- think, I think that's actually like a homage to the to the TV series because that happened quite a lot too. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but it's just, it just, the detail of that is ridiculous. It is only bettered by its sequel, uh, Adam's Family Values, which is even better 
than Adam's Family. So I would suggest watching Adam's Family than watching Adam's Family Values. They're so silly and so ridiculous, and I fucking love them both. But yeah, Adam's Family. Great to watch with the whole family. Not too scary. You meet Cousin It. Just a giant fringe (laughs) that just squeaks. (laughs) It's glorious. It's like the best Tim Burton film that Tim Burton never made. It's like Mark Shaman's score is the best Danny Elfman score not written by Danny Elfman. <laughs> and no matter what anyone says, it was nominated for an Oscar. So was it? What was it nominated for an Oscar for? Best costume yeah. design. Oh, of course. Yeah. Costume design's amazing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. They used up like half the black material in the world <laughs> yeah. that year. Fucking great film. So great. Yes, absolutely. Love it to death. Classics, modern, and scary movies for the entire family. We've given listeners a lot of suggestions for Halloween so far. But with cracking recent horror films like Raw, A Girl Walks Home at Night, and The Babadook, what about scary movies directed by women? We'd be negligent if we didn't touch on the gender landscapes of horror filmmaking. We asked a local authority on the subject for her top five picks. I'm Bryony Kidd, and I'm the director of Stranger With My Face International Film Festival, which specialises in horror directed by women, although we do define horror very broadly and we occasionally also screen work by men. I've been asked to tell you my top five horror films by women directors so you can check them out for Halloween. Um, I've got to preface that by saying that I'm more motivated by wanting to spread the word about maybe slightly lesser known films rather than pinpointing a definitive list. So consider this my top five right now. It could be different next week. The first film I want to talk about is a 2003 film called Perfect Strangers, directed by Gaylene Preston, and it's from New Zealand. Perfect Strangers is about a woman called Melanie, who's played by the Australian actress Rachel Blake. She meets a handsome stranger who's played by the iconic New Zealand actor Sam Neill and accepts his invitation to go back to his place. But when they go to his house, she finds that you have to get there by boat and it's a remote island off the coast and his house is a shack. From there, things get a little bit complicated between them. It's basically a twisted love story. Honey, Tanal, do you love me? Never laugh at me. You really get some kindness in the end. All right, I love you. You make it sound cheap. There's a man that I think he's going to hurt me. What's been going on? What happened? Nothing. I'll look after you. Nothing wrong with him. You have to love me. I just want to go home. It's an amazing film. Uh, I don't think it's had its full recognition yet. We did screen it at stranger with my face this year whether you could call it horror or thriller or something else or some hybrid form you know it's interesting from an academic point of view but it actually doesn't really matter because they're just fantastic films the next film i want to talk about is a 1982 slasher film called the slumber party massacre which is directed by amy holden jones this is a really interesting one because it's basically a pretty straightforward slasher plot about a group of teenage girls who are having a slumber party as the title would suggest and there is a killer on the loose in the neighborhood who uses a power drill the basketball team is planning a party a slumber party for sure no one's getting any sleep the night of the slumber party massacre close your eyes for a second and sleep forever the origins of the film were that it was written by rita may brown who's a well-known feminist author and she wrote it as a parody of the slasher genre actually amy holden jones directed it as if it was a regular slasher film so she didn't direct it as a spoof So what you get is something that is probably a bit smarter than the average film in this genre and is really aware of the traditions and the gender politics of what's going on. But at the same time, it's just quite a fun movie and is quite entertaining and silly and a good time. The next film I want to talk about is from Laos and it is directed by Matty Doe. It is Dearest Sister from 2016. This is a film that we've screened at the festival um, this year. It's a really beautiful film. It is set in Laos and it's about a village girl who travels to the capital city to care for her rich cousin who has 
somehow lost her sight and gained an ability to communicate with the dead. And then something happens, which I won't go into, but makes it so that this village girl has a way to get money and become rich. And it's sort of a power struggle between the two women. This operates as really an effective ghost story that is quite clever but it also has a lot to say about the culture that it's made in and gender roles particularly the lives of these women the next film i want to talk about is a film from 1990 by a very well-known director this is probably one of her lesser known titles it is catherine bigelow's blue steel whether or not this is horror i guess is debatable it's it's a thriller it's an action thriller but as i say all the time i don't really care about strict genre definitions so you just have to give me that leeway so it stars the wonderful jamie lee curtis as a young rookie cop called megan turner and she ends up killing and shooting a suspect while he's holding up um, a grocery store. And unbeknownst to her, somebody is watching this happen and becomes fixated with the image of her, a young woman holding a gun and blowing someone away with it. And that person becomes a stalker and becomes a, a killer. Jamie Lee Curtis is a cop yes. with a problem. Drop it! I'm for Put the gun down now! <laughs> 24 hours on the force and she's already blown some poor slob's face off. No gun found at the scene, officer. Turning nothing on the victim. The men on the force won't believe her. It was there. I saw it. The man at her side can't help her. I think somebody out there likes you. It's a fascinating film because it's very suspenseful. It's very entertaining. But it's really about the symbolism and maybe the fetishization of violence. The gender politics of it is so interesting because there's a man that she meets who's played by Ron Silver. There's one of her colleagues, a detective played by Clancy Brown. They, they sort of define her by her new role as a cop and they respond to it in different ways. It makes them perhaps uncomfortable. It's a fantastic film. The cast is great. The themes are really, really interesting. It works on the level of pure entertainment, but it's very, very smart. Finally, I want to talk about a micro-budget feature from 2010 called Schooner of Blood. It's a really, really low-budget film directed by Kate Glover. It's a pretty simple story where there's a killer who's stalking a pub in a, in a small town and there's a rising body count, all that kind of thing. And yes, there is a moment where somebody is killed in the sort of back room of the bar and then you see the bar person pulling a beer and blood comes out of the tap into the beer glass. And I mean, I think really the whole thing's worthwhile just for that moment alone because it's so cool. <laughs> um, unfortunately, when this film was released overseas, it was known as Slaughtered, whereas obviously Schooner of Blood is a much cooler title. Check this out if you can. Okay, thank you and have a very happy and entertaining and creepy Halloween. Strange With My Face International Film Festival's website can be viewed at strangewithmyface.com. We have some great giveaways this week. We have five copies of Sofia Coppola's spectacular Southern Gothic The Beguiled on Blu-ray up for grabs. Starring Nicole Kidman, Kirsten Dunst, Elle Fanning and Colin Farrell, the film tells the story of a girls' boarding school during the American Civil War. A Union soldier is found badly wounded and taken into the school to be cared for, but the man's presence inadvertently leads to bitter jealousy and betrayal. To win this great prize, head over to maketheswitch.com.au forward slash comps now. And before we go, we'd like to offer you some cinematic inspiration with each of us suggesting one film that you should see this week and why. I mean, in addition to all the other horror films that we've already recommended that you watch, you've got a pretty packed schedule, let's be honest. I'm going to extend on that and I'm going to go with Another horror oh, kind chase. of film. Um, <laughs> horror kind of film. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it is horror, but it's incredibly different to anything that we've actually discussed. It's also a little bit poignant because we've, uh, in the past, bagged out Greg McLean's films immensely on this podcast. But this is a great film. Wolf Creek, 2005. It's Australian. It's set in the outback. It has an incredible performance oh, by John so Jarrett good. as a psychopathic serial killer. These poor, 
unknowing tourists who stumble up across his uh, home and uh, consequentially are tied up and tortured and inevitably murdered. And it is it's something to behold. It's exceptionally well it made. Is. It's an exceptional film. So, it's all about the laugh. Oh John Jarrett's laugh is what, like, sends oh. the, sh- yeah, the shivers down it, his like, line. Honestly, it is the one role that will define him forever, John Jarrett. It's oh, just... <laughs> it's hard to watch him on Play School after watching him okay. in Wolf Creek, let's be honest. Mm, sorry, no. Not even Better Homes and Gardens. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it, uh, nothing stands up to this. It is the stuff of nightmares. And the the reason it sets it apart from anything else is I think it's it's gore horror as well. It's really visual. It's really disturbing. Uh, I'm not a big fan of blood and sharp implements. Uh, so it affected me in many ways when I saw this um, back in Wagga in 2005. I think the worst part of like, Wolf Creek, though, is like the um, the bits where you like you don't actually see any gore, and it's just him talking and like describing what he's doing. Yeah, um, when he's talking about how you know what, what he's going to do to um, the girl after he stabs her in the back, the, Ooh, yeah, the like head the on, a stick, on a stick. Oh, yeah, but it's also the fact that it's based on the backpacker, the murder, like, the Ivan Malat murders. Is the fact that there is a certain degree of verisimilitude to it. Yeah, it's based on this whole series of actual events, like a combination of different things which have happened, basically. So makes it even it's not, more. It's not a good uh, tourism ad for Australia. Don't go backpacking in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. it's uh, I was going to say, like, um, if, you know, what you mentioned before, a picnic at Hanging Rock and stuff. Like Australia's landscape is so effective in like these horror movies. There's just something about, you know, the land and where we live, oh, which is yeah. this is sort of air of something. It's the fact that we as colonists do not actually belong on this landscape and so we the horror of the landscape is the fact that we don't fit on it we don't fit within it Mm -mm. it Mm. is an entity unto itself that may very well just swallow us whole and we'll disappear into it It, everything like wolf creek and also i think in picnic at hanging rock it's just so big it's so immense like there isn't basically there is no escape from Mm. this place that you are like if you're trapped with a psychopath in the outback there ain't nobody for like hundreds of kilometers who's gonna save you so there is one more horror film for you to check out just in case you didn't have enough all right jess do you have something a little more lighthearted for us i do actually oh Um, how lovely Thank you. This film has actually already been mentioned in this podcast one, once before, not um, to a review degree, but I'm going to flush Lucky. it out a bit. Yeah, I'm going to flush it out a bit further. So, if you're looking for a film that is a masterclass in independent filmmaking, comedic filmmaking, and the most pitch perfect cast you've ever seen in your entire life, then look no further than just across the Dutch for Hunt for oh, the Wilder People. Masterpiece. We're- <laughs> masterpiece masterpiece so, so good. this is directed so by takai watiti who we've already spoken about earlier in the podcast because he directed the who latest thor genius. film he is a genius and his specialty is comedy and this oh. film is so beautiful and hilarious and i reckon in the last 10 years i don't think i've watched a film so repeatedly as much as I have Hunt for the Wilder People, and it just gets better every single time. Um, this film gave us Julian Dennison, who you will see next in Deadpool 2. He plays Ricky Baker, who is a troublesome youth who in the foster care system, and he gets sent to live with Bella and Heck, played by Sam Neill, and um, certain circumstances arise, and Julian is, is threatened to be sent back into the child welfare system. So in order to escape that, he runs away with his dog Tupac into the New Zealand wilderness and Sam Neill has to go after him. And when there's a, let's say, a series of miscommunications, uh, they end up going on the run from the authorities for months at a time while the head of the uh, child welfare agency go, <laughs> goes looking for them. <laughs> Uh, along with a cop and the um, the media gets behind. No, every it. single cop in New Zealand. Every single cop in New Zealand, yes. But the media gets behind. And the army. The, army. the media gets behind uh, this pair as like these local sort of infamous like heroes. The underdogs. 
the underdogs, yeah, and these heroes. Oh, I cannot recommend this film enough. It's so good. It's so good. It was like something like the highest grossing New Zealand film in history or independent New Zealand film in history. I don't know whether Lord of the Rings films fall on that spectrum of New Zealand films. No. But um, no. it was huge. It won all these awards. It went, it went on forever and it was just absolutely brilliant. So before you see Thor or after you see Thor and absolutely fall in love with it and piss your pants laughing, if you want to know where that director came from, you go back and you go see Hunt for the Wilder People or you go back further. Actually, several podcasts ago, I recommended another Takai Watiti film called uh, What We Did in the Shadows, which was equally as brilliant. So, yeah, which means enjoy. we don't have many of his films left. No, no. <laughs> I think we've just got There's boy. only boy, boy. left. Yeah. That's literally yeah. it. <laughs> we've just got boy. Um, <laughs> then we can recommend Thor Ragnarok when it comes out. Yes. But... <laughs> Next week, <laughs> two minutes, <laughs> Jess recommends Thor Ragnarok. Oh, no, he, um, he did Eagle and Shark as well. So. Oh, he did too. He oh, did yeah. too. Um, yes, but... <laughs> Today we're talking sorry, about hunt sorry. for the will hunt for the will to people. Well, yeah, hunt that one out and check it out. Uh, Daniel, what have you got for us this week? Um, I'm also going to go for something very lighthearted and one a, a film that Good. it's um it's it's one that I was introduced to about a year ago and was so embarrassed that I'd never seen it because it is so delightful. Um, it's a 1982 musical called Victor Victoria. Uh, it's set in 1930s Paris, and it's about uh, a soprano whose name is uh, Victoria Grant, played by Julie Andrews, and she wants to get a job oh. working, you know, being a singer in a cabaret. But no one will hire her until she meets Carol Toddy Todd, played by Robert Preston, a homosexual man who runs a drag show. And they concoct this idea to get Victoria into the show because she has a great voice. But the only way they can do it is if she pretends to be a man pretending to be a woman. So it's, and like we've seen this kind of story before, uh, obviously, but this is kind of the best version of it. So it's Julie Andrews playing a woman, playing a man, playing a woman, uh, who then attracts the attention of uh, James Garner's character, King Marchand, who's a gangster. And he's very confused because he's really attracted to Victor, but not knowing that it's Victoria. It's just this wonderful comedy of errors um, with this fantastic music composed by Henry Mancini. And it's directed and written by Blake Edwards, who was the um, writer and director of The Party and the original Pink, Pink Panther films and Julie Andrews' husband. It's probably his best film. I think it's one of Julie Andrews' best performances. It is hysterically funny. Like It has all of the great um, kind of slapstick comedy sequences you would expect from Blake Edwards after seeing things like The Party and The Pink Panther. Um, and it's also a very a very open about sexual politics. It's an, an, a, the characters are openly, like, a lot of the characters are openly gay. Um, a lot of, it plays all around with, gen, with gender and gender politics um, and it openly discusses them. And Julie Andrews' character and the way that she moves through the film feels very progressive for a film made in 1982 and i was quite shocked that it wasn't a queer classic that it's not a well i think it is considered one but not one that i had been introduced to before so if you want something that is ridiculously fun and has fucking great music and an astoundingly good performance from everyone involved um you will be screaming with laughter at everything leslie ann warren does but then it's leslie ann warren so she's hilariously funny in everything um yeah victor victoria the original film is just it's delightful all right, Jake, take us home. What do you got? Okay, so tying back into uh, Ingrid Goes West, um, The Talent of Mr. Ripley, um, uh, directed by oh. Anthony Minghella, screenplay by Anthony Minghella, based on uh, Patricia, uh, Patricia Highsmith's uh, 1955 crime novel, um, the first in the series. Uh, this is like a really awesome movie. It's um, I've read all the books. It isn't the... I guess the best adaptation of the books. Uh, in the books, uh, Tom Ripley... Um, He's a, a young outsider living in 1950s New York. Um, he gets mistaken for uh, a friend of um, a wealthy playboy who's living in Italy. Uh, the playboy's father hires Tom to go to Italy and, and bring his son back. And um, when Tom gets to Italy, he's just like, I you know, quite enjoy this lifestyle. I think I'm going to stay here for a while. Um, and he becomes infatuated with the playboy and the lifestyle. And um, in, in the books, I guess, like Tom is a lot more... Um, I guess asexual, so he's just um, he's a bit more of a chameleon, and he just really loves the lifestyle. Like he loves like having money. He just loves uh, being in a country where he's not you know poor and um, trying to make do. In the films, uh, there's a lot more of a sexual aspect. So uh, the Playboy is played by Jude Law, 
Jude Law mm. uh, is a handsome man. Let's just like sort of uh, admit that. Uh, and particularly <laughs> in that film, particularly in that film. Yeah. I think sort of um, no matter, you know, if you're into dudes or chicks, you have to see this film and you'll admit that Jude Law is a good looking dude. This is like sort of peak Jude Law. <laughs> and uh, so Tom Ripley's just kind of like, cool, this guy's awesome. Um, and he sort of moves from, you know, wanting to be friends with um, with Dickie Greenleaf, that's the guy's name, uh, yeah, into yeah, wanting to character. have like a, 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 yeah, yeah, he wants to have like a super close relationship with him. And then when that doesn't happen, he wants to become him. Yeah, this movie is just um, like, Anthony Geller is like a great director. Uh, it's like beautifully shot. But I reckon it's his best. Totally. I reckon it's definitely Anthony Miguel's yeah, best film. I think so. It's just so good. Yeah, it is like so good. It's just so so strange that um, because I love the books and it's just like so different from the books, but at the same time, it really works as a film. Mm. Um, I couldn't imagine it becoming a series, but um, I guess the the more like romantic aspects of this film really kind of make you mm. sympathize with Tom Ripley. Um. In the in the books, he's more of like a kind of a cool, you know, anti-hero, and but also like a bit, you know, like a sociopath, I guess. In the in the movies, he's kind of like a just kind of a fucked up guy. Yeah. Um. Sorry, I, I digress. Anyway, uh, uh, the talent, Mr. Ripley, uh, well worth uh, checking out. And Kate Blanchett's in it, and Gwyneth Paltrow's in it, and um, um, who's the guy? Philip Seymour Hoffman. The, um, and Phil, Phil and Seymour Hoffman playing like the most obnoxious best friend, um, ever. Yeah, just a really great. Um, I just see described it as like a, a like a psychological thriller. Well worth seeking out. Yeah, it's an unexpectedly violent one. Like the, there's moments in it that because it's so beautiful to look at and it's so meticulous mm. and careful and kind of dreamlike the moments where it bursts into unexpected violence are really shocking yeah really well done film i think and also super underrated the talent mr ripley go and check it out good hustle guys good films this week gosh yeah some brilliant suggestions and you can find the links to all the articles we've talked about on this week's podcast at make the switch.com.au please subscribe to Switchcast on iTunes or your favourite podcast platform and don't forget to rate us and stay in touch on Twitter I'm at Charlie underscore David Jess at Miss Jess underscore Switch Daniel at Daniel Lamon and Jake at Jake Chatty like it? Follow it. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Make the Switch AU to stay up to date with all the latest reviews, news, trailers, and giveaways. And you can find all the notes and links to everything we've discussed on this week's podcast, as well as other episodes, by visiting switchcast.com.au. On next week's show, I'll have my verdict on the very animated biopic Loving Vincent. Plus, I'll take a look at the ornithologist. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you all next week. Switch.